home and native land, Toronto's newest pulp culture podcast, covering your favorite comics, collectibles, media, nerdific origin stories, and more. Hosted by your northern neighbor, Joey Pengelinen. Here it is, nerdos and nerdettes. Comics Inc. Hey, nerdos and nerdettes, this is Joey from Comics Inc. We have Kenya. And Len, also from Comics Inc. And we are talking about Justice League. Dark! Dark. That was really good. Actually, that was the best one you've done. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Dark. And, uh, of course, who better to introduce the dark world of comics but the queen of dark herself? Her name is Karen Berger, and she started Vertigo Comics. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know who she is, she was an editor um, at DC. So she was working on a ton of projects from Wonder Woman to Swamp Thing. And she was with DC for a really long time as a senior editor. And in around 1993, she kind of was the one who spearheaded DC's new initiative, which was Vertigo Comics. And Len, being the big fan of Vertigo... <laughs> it is my favorite thing. That is his drug of it's, choice. It's his thing. Vertigo. Yeah, like, uh, pretty much, Vertigo was came out in the 80s, and, yeah, as you said, it introduced mature comics to... Mature. Uh, yeah, mature comics. Mature comics. Very 18-plus with, you know, nudity, violence, mm-hmm. well, and mostly mature themes. So you have classics such as... Hellblazer, Shade the Changing Man, Swamp Thing, like all, all these things written by these new British writers. Mm-hmm. Uh, because at the time when they hired Alan Moore and he blew up with uh, Swamp Thing, they were like, we need more Alan Moores. Can we get more of those? He's British. The British must be, uh, be a lot like him. So they brought in like Neil Gaiman, Warren Ellis, uh, Peter Milligan, etc. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, just comics started getting great since there. Yeah, and um, what it really did was, so it didn't really negate the popularity or any of, like, the success of the mainstream, you know, with superheroes and all of that, Mm -hmm. but what it did was it targeted an older audience, because essentially a lot of us as readers, you know, we grow up, we, our tastes change a little bit, they become Mm -hmm. maybe not necessarily more refined, but we're exposed (laughs) to the world, like, we want to, we want things that are a little bit more confrontational, I guess. And a what bit more depth? Yeah, yeah, and what Vertigo did was it was like, okay, here are writers, go for it, just unleash your creativity, get as dark, get as intense, mm-hmm. you know, artists, get as graphic as you want, do the things that you really want to do, and we're gonna market this for our adult readers who really want something that is, you know, a less less about those like beautiful moral lessons that we get from mm-hmm. our superhero friends, and more about the really dark, gritty stuff. Of being human. You know what? Like, yeah. As I've been thinking about this, this is DC starting Vertigo. And DC, what are they known for? Like in the beginning, uh, Action Comics number one. You know, mm-hmm. um, it was good morals, good values, um, the quote unquote American way. Uh, sorry, we are talking about the, <laughs> the, thir- the yeah. 30s and the 40s here. Um, and they were the first people, I guess, to step up and be like, you know what? Our fans are growing up too. Yeah. You know, so we need to catch up on them. Yeah. And actually, really interestingly, like you mentioned the American way, Shade the Changing Man, mm-hmm. like the whole like first arc of that series was about going, saying like, hey, here's the American way. Here's why it's messed up. And introduced this uh, villain called the American Scream, mm-hmm. which was the embodiment of American insanity. So you ha- it attacked themes like racism, mm-hmm. uh, normalcy, etc. So it's just like... You know, people coming in, it's like, here are the things that you liked as a kid, and let's twist it a bit. Yeah, it's definitely about shaking the status quo, and I definitely think pop culture at the time, like, um, the grunge movement was big during the, you know, it started in the late 80s, the 90s, you know, we had bands like Nirvana, you know, Pearl Jam, um, Pearl Jam like yeah. things like that. And it was all about this sort of awakening of like and a recognition of there's a darkness. So like comic, there's comic book angst too. Yeah. It's not just music angst and teenage angst. Like 
just just like the kids that grew up and their parents that grew up reading these things it's a direct parallel exactly of what was going on both in comics and both in real life yeah and i mean art always imitates life so in Mm. a sense like this was sort of necessary for the time and i think the reason why vertigo stayed and was so successful is because it created these incredible characters and Mm. incredible stories that really resonated with people and continues to like to this day yeah Mm-hmm. And uh, so now, uh, that being said, of course, Karen Berger, she teamed up with Dark Horse Comics, another um, publisher, to launch Burger Books, a new line of creator-owned uh, comics and graphic novels line. Um, and I think these are the kind of projects that I also really look forward to because I grew up DC and then I moved on to Marvel and then now I'm kind of like whoa there's these other things like Image and there's Dark Horse and there's Vertigo there's so many things that are just untapped for typical fans like me so I'm really thankful that you guys are here to show me the way with that yeah and for sure I think for me like Karen Berger has mad props for being just you know a woman pioneering in male industry Mm -hmm. oh my gosh yeah she was one of the few women to really make that big of a mark in the comic book world Mm -hmm. and you know I think a lot of people can say that her involvement influenced them and their art especially now with a lot Mm -hmm. of writers and creators that are currently publishing so you know we have to celebrate women like that absolutely and Jeanette mm -hmm. Kahn too yeah like there's so many other women but like Karen Berger really stands out especially because she is like the person behind something that produced all of these great Vertigo titles that Mm -hmm. are a little bit you know sitting on the outside of what people in the mainstream really think is traditionally a comic yeah Mm. and uh, so of course we're here to talk about Justice League Dark the animation that came out on 2017 right guys yeah yeah so let me know a little bit about that storyline um, so Justice League Dark was basically um, a bit built off of the 2011 Justice League Dark run with the New 52 DC mm-hmm. Comics uh, run. Um, and the movie is essentially following, you know, it starts off with the regular Justice League, Batman, Wonder Woman, Superman, the gang. Um, yeah. And they're encountering this strange supernatural happenings where people in the city are going mad and like murdering each other and doing these crazy things. And they're like, it's magic. So who do we <laughs> of course, turn we'll to? Blame it on magic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who so did they turn to? They turn to John Constantine. Of that course. untrustworthy con man who's got a heart of a heart of cigarettes. Heart of cigarettes. Yeah. Probably, <laughs> probably lung cancer. Probably oh, lung that, cancer. you should totally a, read Dangerous every, Habits. A beautiful <laughs> Manchester accent, scruffy, sting-looking man. Um, but yeah, so the interesting thing with the film is it actually really leverages Batman. So he's sort of where the audience sits as like the everyman. And he's yeah. a little bit skeptical about magic. He's like, okay, you know, I don't really know much about it. I'm kind of skeptical about it. But I have this friend in Zatanna who is a magician. So we're going to team up and... And we're going to find Constantine and kind of figure out what's going on here. So it sort of follows this team now of Batman, Zatanna, Constantine. We have Dead Man. Swamp Thing. Swamp, Swamp Thing. Thing and <laughs> Etrigan. Uh-huh. And they're trying to figure out, you know, what's the cause of the supernatural happenings that are making people go crazy and, you know, kill each other. So I don't want to spoil much more of the storyline, but the animation is great. Um, voice acting was fantastic. You, you got Matt Ryan in there, oh, like yeah, back from the Constantine just, show. <laughs> you know what? With Matt Ryan, I can't, in, because of him, I can't envision any other voice. I can't envision any other person. I mean, not only does he sound like your quintessential John Constantine, he looks the part too. Um, I'm watching he DC's the Legends p- right now, and he's uh, he's doing a great job. Yeah, he looks the part, but he's got a mix of accents because he's mm. originally Welsh. And, oh, is he? Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Oh, like you, you hear a bit of it in uh, in the way he talks, and John is more of a Liverpoolian. Liverpool, a Liverpool person. Yeah. he comes yeah. from Liverpool, uh-huh. so like uh, oh, they address it in the show. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, and I mean he's been so popular that there is going to be a new animated series out called Constantine: City of Demons. Oh, it's mm. already out. I'm trying to access it on CWC. It's on CWC, but I'm oh. Canadian, so they won't let me in. Um, but <laughs> yeah, that's how much he has a, a fan base and a following. That mm. you know he was able to, unfortunately, with the Constantine TV series getting canceled, like animation and then Legends of Tomorrow was a mm-hmm. way to bring the character yeah, back. Yeah, he's a season regular now. Season hey. four. Yeah, so he yeah. 
does um, he does a great job, obviously, in the film. And then there's a couple other voice actors in there from the other DC um, animated films. And uh, what about? Dead man, Boston brand, having like a Boston accent. I I don't know. That didn't Boston? seem. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm the dead man. That the didn't man? sound like no, him, but like it was not yeah, like him, but one. it sounded you know bad. You know what? I think they were aiming to like kind of revamp the character of Dead Man a little bit to make him a little bit more comedic and just a little. Uh... Do you know what's really funny about it is because Dead Man, I know him from the Brightest Day series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I I never I've never known his voice, you know. So yeah. in my head, he just always sounds really ghoulish, but he probably doesn't. Well, like I would appreciate him with that accent, but if it wasn't so high pitched. Yeah, I mean, I, did, I, I, did, I didn't mind it. I actually thought it was okay. Like, I think that I liked the idea of sort of Dead Man as being, you know, not necessarily a grim, dark ghoul. Well, but I'm not saying of, he should be grim, I mean, dark, like, but he, was he the almost was like a caps. Yeah, he was like the he character was himself was in the circus, and he to me felt kind of like Casper, but like grown up. <laughs> so yeah, he's but like, Devin Sawa. <laughs> but his act wasn't about like entertaining the kids. Like he was hit, like his stage name was Dead Man because he did deadly things. Things. It's supposed to be the stuff that shocks you. Mm-hmm. You don't put like you know Ronald McDonald doing that. Actually, that sounds like an amazing idea. Yeah, you know Back what? <laughs> we're gonna revisit that for next <laughs> so, <laughs> so, time. So we're gonna we're gonna say make your own judgment on um, yeah. the dead man thing. But I know you had some points you wanted to talk about with um, Justice League Dark. Joey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so another thing about Justice League Dark, it was a 2011 comic run. Mm. Um, and there was there was a part in the the first I think it was the, the first issue I honestly I love the cast like I love how yeah. it is in the comic books and I love how it is in the in the animation because I remember Batman was like I can do this myself sorry I don't know why he sounded like a black woman but um, <laughs> he was like I can do this all by myself to Zatanna and Zatanna was like of course you can Bruce and you turn around and he was just. He, he, she like magicked him on a wall and just walked off and started doing her own thing. Yeah, but I feel like the movie and the second half of the run are very different from what they intended to do with uh, Justice League Dark. Because yeah. essentially, when Peter Milligan first wrote it, it was like a bunch of flawed people who are barely a team, coincidentally working so on something DC together. DC Legends with magic. DC Legends about horror. So it was Justice League okay. horror at first, and then. Someone's like, hey, um, that's not really selling, so can you make this Justice League magic and have them like fight things? It was like, no, right. it's about the horrors that you can't punch. Like Enchantress, yeah. like possessing people, and then it's like, okay, now we're punching you can't Felix punch ghosts, house. Right? It's not necessarily bad, but I liked the first one. No, I just love horror. To, to one other point here, do we consider any of these guys typically superheroes? Yeah, absolutely not. Some of them. I, I, <laughs> just because Justice League, you know, you think I don't Justice know, I League, think, right? I think it's hard. I mean, I feel like, okay, superhero is always synonymous with the idea of a heroic person who happened to have powers. Who yeah. wears primary colors. Or, yeah. yeah, who wears <laughs> primary colors, you know, a cape. Um, and I feel like you can almost, like, I think superhero isn't a great term to apply to these characters, but mm. I don't think it negates them from being heroic. They're heroic. For sure. That's right. Yeah. I yeah. think they are heroes in a sense, and I think they in embody sort of elements of that like traditional sense of what we believe a hero to be, self-sacrificing, mm-hmm. you know, willing to put their lives on the ru- the line for others. Mm-hmm. Um you know. So far, John Constantine doesn't fit any of these, but I agree with the he, rest. He does, he does it to his own benefit. He I does think. it, but I also feel like the versions that I've always seen him like in have always kind of at its at the core. There's a good man in there, like somewhere I, under the yeah, I guess that, all the way all in all there. of that thing. And I I really appreciate that about the character. Yeah. Like I yeah. like that he is supposed to be kind of an ass. I'm sorry to yeah. say this on no, he is podcast. Of you course, know, like yeah. ass. Like he is not the it's nicest. Kenya. He's not the <laughs> nicest person. Uh, he he's he's written to be really like rough on the exterior, very much like a huge chip on his shoulder. But yeah. Yeah. I, I like that the fact that deep down that there are redeeming elements because I think the whole point is for people that really relate to him, they see that in themselves. Like mm-hmm. I want to be able to have moments of like of darkness and of, roughness. Yeah. I mean, like darkness. being able to embrace that about yeah. myself but not mm-hmm. negating the fact that I can do good. Also be good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but yeah. like um 
He's that, and also, like, in the first issue of Hellblazer, like, really breaks the door down on, like, what uh, Constantine is, Mm -hmm. and uh, pretty much the premise of that was that there's a big demon, his best friend accidentally set it loose, so what he did is that uh, the demon needs to be, like, captured again, put back inside the bottle, and a bottle being a human body, Mm -hmm. and so he makes his best friend the bottle, so pretty much... He betrayed his best friend some, since he was a kid, locks a demon inside him and, and his uh, best friend.